here today to talk about uh, two ideas that, at least based on my observations at Khan Academy, are, are kind of the core, the, the key leverage points for, for learning. And it's the idea of mastery and the idea of mindset. And I saw this in the early days when I was working with my cousins. A lot of them were having trouble with math at first because they had all of these gaps accumulated in their, in their learning. And, and because of that, at some point, they got to an algebra class and they might have been a little bit shaky on some of the pre-algebra. And uh, because of that, uh, they, they thought they didn't have the math gene, or they'd get to a calculus class and they'd be a little bit uh, shaky on, on the algebra. I saw in the early days when I uh, was uploading up some of those, those videos on YouTube, and, and I realized that people who are not my cousins were watching. <laughs> and, I, and, you know, at first, those, those, those comments were just simple thank yous, and I thought that was a pretty big deal. I don't know how much time y'all spend on YouTube. Uh, most of the comments are not thank you. They're a little edgier than that. But then the comments got a little bit more intense. Uh, you know, student after student saying that uh, they had grown up not liking math. It was getting difficult as they got into more advanced math topics. By the time they got to algebra, they had so many gaps in their knowledge that they just couldn't engage with it. Uh, and they thought that they didn't have the math gene. But when they were a little bit older, they took a little bit of agency and they decided to engage. They found resources like Khan Academy and they were able to fill in those gaps and master those concepts and that reinforced their mindset that, that it wasn't fixed, that they actually were capable of, of learning mathematics. And in a lot of ways, this is how you would master a lot of things in life. It's the way that you would learn a martial art. In a martial art, you would uh, practice the white belt skills as long as necessary, and only when you've mastered it, you would move on to become a yellow belt. It's the way that you would learn a musical instrument. You practice the basic piece over and over again, and only when you've mastered it, you go on to the more advanced one. But what we point out, this is not the way that a, a, a traditional academic model is structured, the type of academic model that uh, most of us grew up in. In a traditional academic model, we group students together, usually by age and around middle school age and, and perceived ability, and we shepherd them all together at the same pace. And what typically happens, let's say we're in a middle school pre-algebra class and the current unit is on exponents. Uh, the teacher will give a lecture on exponents, then we'll uh, go home, do some homework. The next morning we'll review the homework, then we'll get another lecture, homework, lecture, homework. That'll continue for about two or three weeks, and then we get a test. And on that test, maybe I get a 75%, maybe you get a 90%, maybe you get a 95%. And even though that, that test has identified gaps in our knowledge, I didn't know 25% of the material, even the A student, what was the 5% they didn't know, even though we've identified those gaps, the whole class will then move on to the next subject, probably a, a more advanced subject that's going to build on those gaps. It might be logarithms or negative exponents. And that process continues, and, and you immediately start to realize how, how strange this is. I didn't know 25% of the more foundational thing, and now I'm being pushed to the more advanced thing. And this will continue for months, and it'll continue for years, all the way to at some point, I might be in an algebra class or a trigonometry class, and I hit a wall. And it's not because algebra is fundamentally difficult or because uh, uh, the student isn't bright. It's because I'm seeing an equation, and they're dealing with exponents, and that 30% that I didn't know is, is showing up. And then I, I start, and then I start to disengage. And to appreciate how, how absurd that is, imagine if we did other things in our life that way say, home building. <laughs> so we bring in the contractor, say, told we have two weeks to build the foundation, do what you can. <laughs> so they, they do what they can, maybe it rains, maybe some of the supplies don't show up, and but two weeks later, the inspector comes, looks around, says, okay, the concrete's still wet right over there, that part's not quite up to code, I'll give it an 80%. <laughs> Say, great, that's a C, let's build the first floor. <laughs> Same thing. Yeah, we have two weeks, do what you can. Inspector shows up in two weeks, it's a 75%. Great, that's a D plus. Second floor, third floor. And all of a sudden, while you're building the third floor, that whole structure collapses. And if your reaction to that is the reaction that you typically have in education, or that a lot of folks have in education, you might say, maybe we had a bad contractor, or maybe we needed better inspection or more frequent inspection. But what was really broken was the process. We were artificially constraining how long we had to do something, pretty much ensuring a variable outcome. And, and we, we took the trouble of inspecting and identifying those gaps, but then we built right on top of it. So the idea of mastery learning is to do the exact opposite. Instead of artificially constraining when and how long, fixing when and how long you work on something, pretty much ensuring that variable outcome, 
the A, B, C, D, F, and do it the other way around. What's variable is when and how long a student actually has to work on something, and what's fixed is that they actually master the material. And it's important to realize that not only will this make the student learn their exponents better, but it'll reinforce the, the right mindset muscles. It makes them realize that if you got 20% wrong on something, it doesn't mean that you have a C branded in your DNA somehow. It means that you should just keep working on it. You should have grit. You should have perseverance. You should take agency over your learning. Now, a lot of skeptics might say, well, hey, this is all great. Philosophically, this whole idea of mastery-based learning and its connection to mindset, students taking agency over their learning, makes a lot of sense, but, but, but it seems impractical. To actually do it with students, it seems like every student would be on their own track. They would have to be personalized. You would have to have private tutors. You would have to work worksheets for every student. And, and there were experiments. These aren't new ideas. There were experiments in Winnetka, Illinois, 100 years ago, where they did mastery-based learning. And they saw great results, but, they, but they, they said it wouldn't scale because it was logistically difficult. And the, the teacher had to give different worksheets to every student, give on-demand assessments. But now, today, it's, it's no longer impractical. We have the tools to do it. Students need an explanation at their own time and pace. Well, there's on-demand video for that. They need practice. They, have feed, they need feedback. Well, there's, there's, there's adaptive exercises. It's readily available for students. And when that happens, all sorts of neat things happen. One, the students can actually master the concepts but they're also building their growth mindset, they're building their grit, their perseverance, the, they're taking agency over their learning. And all sorts of beautiful things can start to happen in the actual classroom. Instead of it being focused on the lecture, students can interact with each other. They can get deeper mastery over the material. They can go into simulation, Socratic dialogue. And you know, to appreciate what we're talking about and, and kind of the, 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 the tragedy of, of lost potential here, I like to give a, a little bit of a, a thought experiment. If we were to go 400 years into the past, to Western Europe, which even then was one of the more literate parts of, of the planet, you would see that about 15% of the population knew how to read. And I suspect that if you ask someone who did know how to read, say a member of the clergy, what percentage of the population do you think is even capable of reading? And they might say, well, with a, a great education system, uh, maybe, maybe 20 or 30%. But if you fast forward to today, we know that that prediction would have been wildly pessimistic, that it's pretty close to 100% of the population is capable of reading. But if I were to ask you a, a similar question, what percentage of the population do you think is capable of truly mastering calculus, or understanding organic chemistry, or, or being able to contribute to, to cancer research? A lot of y'all might say, well, with a great education system, maybe 20, 30%. But what if that estimate is just based on your own experience in a non-mastery framework, your own experience with yourself or, or observing your peers, where you're being pushed at this set pace through classes, accumulating all these gaps. Even when you got the A that 95%, what was that 5% that you missed? And it keeps accumulating all the way that you get to a more advanced class, and all of a sudden you hit a wall and you say, oh, I'm not meant to be a cancer researcher. I'm not meant to be a physicist. I'm not meant to be a mathematician. And I suspect that that actually is the case, but if you were allowed to be operating in a mastery framework. If you were allowed to really take agency over your learning, and when you get something wrong, embrace it. View that failure as a moment of learning. That number of, of the percent that could really master calculus or, or, or understand organic chemistry is actually a lot closer to 100%. And this isn't even just a, a nice to have. I, I think it's a social imperative. We're, we're exiting what you could call the industrial age, and we're going into this, whatever, information revolution. And it's clear that some things are happening. In the industrial age, society was a pyramid. And at the base of the pyramid, you had a, a large pool of, you needed human labor. In the middle of the pyramid, you had kind of an information processing, a, a bureaucracy class. And at the top of the pyramid, you had your, your owners of capital and, and, and your entrepreneurs and, and your creative class. But we know what's happening already as we go into this information revolution. The bottom of that pyramid, automation is going to take over. Even that middle tier, information processing, that's what computers are good at. So as a society, we have a question. All this new productivity is happening because of this technology, but who participates in it? Is it just going to be that very top of the pyramid, in which case, what does everyone else do? How, how do they operate? Or do we do something that's more aspirational? Do we actually attempt to invert the pyramid, where you have a large creative class, where almost everyone can participate as an entrepreneur, an artist, as a researcher. 
And I don't think that this is utopian. I really think that this is all based on the idea of we let people tap into their potential by mastering concepts, by being able to exercise agency over their learning, that, that they can get there. And from a, you know, when you think of it as just a, a citizen of the world, it's pretty exciting. When you think about the type of equity we can have and the rate at which civilization could even progress. And so I'm pretty optimistic about it. I think it's going to be a, a pretty exciting time to be alive. Thank you.